Who is Boba Fett? When we first see Boba Fett in The Empire Strikes Back, we aren't meant to know much about him. He's a mysterious character with little screen time and fewer spoken lines, and he's meant to be a throwaway character. Yet, he captured audiences and quickly became a fan favorite. In Return of the Jedi, we actually see him in action, just before he is clumsily bumped in the giant sand spiky booty hole mouth thing. This time, he only has one spoken word. Ah! What a disappointing end to such a cool looking character. But it remained. We had no idea who he even was other than a bounty hunter. Well, now we know. I'll be talking about the story of Boba Fett today on Star Wars Fanatic. If in your new round here at these parts, go on and hit that subscribe button like there ain't no room in this town for the two of yous. And turn on notifications to stay up to date on all my Boba Fett, Mandalorian, and general Star Wars content. Also, pull the like button's finger to show your love for what I do here. Now, let's get on with today's topic. Today is August 20th, Boba Fett Friday. And with this first self-imposed day of observation, we'll be talking about the history of Boba Fett. Sure, we all know he was a clone of Jango Fett and raised by Jango for about 10 years of his life until Jango had his head lopped off by the evil Mace Windu. But seriously, all joking aside, there is so much more to Boba Fett than that. And today we will get into just what made Boba Fett the best bounty hunter in the galaxy. But to understand Boba Fett as a bounty hunter, we should go all the way back to Boba Fett's biological grandfather, the journeyman protector of Concord Dawn. All of this is important in understanding Boba Fett because most of it has been made truth or canon by the second season of the Mandalorian series on Disney+. Jango Fett, his mother, his father, and his sister Arla all lived on a farm on Concord Dawn. Jango's father was recently appointed the journeyman protector of the planet, a kind of sheriff. There was also a new Mandalore or leader of the Mandalorian people, Jaster Muriel. But during this time, there was a type of three-way civil war going on for the control of the Mandalorian sector. The true Mandalorians, led by Jaster Muriel, believed in reform. That reform meant that Mandalorians would no longer be conquerors of other worlds, but they would keep their warrior traditions that had been passed down for centuries. Taking on private security, bounty hunting, and acting as hired guns would be acceptable, so long as they only did the job they were paid to do. Jaster Muriel created a canon of honor that would co coincide with the Mandalorian Rezelnari, which detailed a Mandalorian's actions and how they should conduct themselves through priorities of family, honor, duty, and loyalty to their clan. The Death Watch was a faction led by Tor Vizsla during the Civil War that would disagree with Jaster Muriel. They believed Mandalorians should conduct themselves as they have been since the town settled the Mandalorian sector centuries before. They believed that in conquest and assimilation of other cultures into the Mandalorian way. Basically, they were just warriors, but also warmongers. The third faction were the New Mandalorians. This was a pacifist group that believed war and the warrior ways of any kind had brought enough destruction to the Mandalorian people and their way of life. This group believed in politics and diplomacy. Their leader was Duke Adonai Kreese. We would later get to know his older daughter, Duchess Satine Kreese, who led the New Mandalorians after her father's death, and his younger daughter, Bo-Katan Kreese. Bo-Katan sided with Death Watch later, and even later, formed the Night Owls. I'm sure you all know her from the Clone Wars, Star Wars Rebels, and the Mandalorian, so I won't get into that too much. The pacifists didn't fight much during the Civil War, though. They took control of Mandalore while Death Watch and the true Mandalorians were off fighting on other worlds. The other two factions, Death Watch and the true Mandalorians, were mostly evenly matched. Okay, that's the story of the three factions of the Mandalorian Civil War. During this war, a battle extended to Concord Dawn, in particular, the Fett farm that Jango and his family lived on. Jaster Muriel and his warriors were being chased and Jango's father helped them briefly. After Jaster and his group left the care of the Fets, Tor Vizsla and his men showed up. He knew they had helped Jaster. Vizsla killed Jango's father and mother and took his sister captive. Jango managed to escape into the fields of the farm and ran into Jaster Muriel and his men. 
being the Mandalorian way, Jaster recognized that Jango was orphaned and took him under his wing as his own son, adopting Jango Fett into the true Mandalorian code. Jango was taught the Rezulnari and the Canons of Honor. He was trained as a skilled warrior and, as he grew, he would take on bounty hunting missions during the Civil War, in between battles of course. During a rescue mission on Corda 6, it became apparent that they weren't there to rescue a security force on the planet, but rather Death Watch had set a trap for the true Mandalorians. During the battle, Jester Muriel was killed and he left Jango Fett as his successor to the title of Mandalore. This left Jango as the leader of the Mandalorian people, even though he was locked in battles away from Mandalore itself. He was respected by his men and followed his adoptive father's teachings closely. Even though Jaster Muriel had been killed, Death Watch wanted all the true Mandalorians wiped out. So, Tor Vizsla set another trap for Jango Fett and his soldiers. This time, he involved the Jedi, and not just any Jedi, Master Count Dooku and his Padawan. The trap was a success for the most part, in the grand scheme of Death Watch, that is. Jango was captured by the Jedi and put into slavery aboard a spice ship, but all wasn't lost. Jango had poisoned Tor Vizsla and left him to be killed by attacking animals. During his period as a slave, the war had ended. Jango managed to escape and retrieve his armor. While escaping, he stole a Fire Spray 33 class patrol ship. This later would be known as the Slave One, to remind him of his time as a slave and what he went through to escape it. When he returned, the Mandalorian Civil War was at a standstill. Death Watch had been exiled to the Mandalorian moon of Concordia, where they were believed to have died out. Mandalore was being controlled by the pacifist New Mandalorians and all Jango's soldiers had been killed, except for the true Mandalorian who had betrayed him, Montross. Montross left the war and became a lone bounty hunter and Jango was now a clan of one, alone with his slave one. He would become the most notable bounty hunter of his time, but he had competition. This competition was his former colleague, Montross. After the Battle of Naboo, the Jedi Master who captured Jango would ultimately turn to the dark side and secretly devise the beginnings of the destruction of the Jedi Order and the Republic. The first step was to create an army for the Republic in order to initiate a war between the Republic and the growing separatists in the galaxy. So Count Dooku devised a kind of competition, a competition between Jango Fett, who Dooku had witnessed kill six Jedi with his bare hands, and the one that betrayed Jango, Montross. Ultimately, Jango Fett won out and was invited to be the DNA template for the Grand Army of the Republic, before the Republic knew they were even going to have an army. Jango asked for two things from the cloners. He wanted a substantial payment and one unaltered clone to raise as his own. The clone's son would be named Boba, Boba Fett. Jango raised his new son Boba from infancy he taught Boba everything he was taught himself. He was trained in combat, bounty hunting, and more importantly, the Rezulnari and Canons of Honor that had been taught to him by his mentor, Jaster Muriel. Jango would continue those codes of conduct until his death. Even though he was cut off from Mandalorian society, he would still conduct himself as a true Mandalorian, and he expected the same of his clone son, Boba. During his stint with the Kaminoan cloners, Jango would also take on the role as private security for Count Dooku. He would often take young Boba with him on assignments. It was one of these assignments that would prove to be the end of the father-son team. Anakin Skywalker and Padme Amidala were captured on Geonosis along with Anakin's master, Obi-Wan Kenobi. They were sentenced to death by the Geonosians in the arena, but as they fought off the beasts of the Romanesque stadium, the Jedi arrived with the newly discovered clone army, and so the Clone Wars begins. During the battle, Jango killed several Jedi, but was soon outmatched by a Jedi Council leader, Mace Windu. Mace killed Jango in full view of Jango Fett's son, Boba. As the Clone Wars raged on, Boba Fett stayed on the move. He would learn the bounty hunting trade from other notable bounty hunters such as Aura Singh, Cad Bane, and Bosk. Boba Fett was learning it fast. This is crucial in his development as a character because it's important to know that Boba intended to fill his father's role. When Boba was about 12 years old, he pretended to be one of the other clone cadets. 
they toured a Republic cruiser and learned some of the functions of the ship. His mission was simple, blend in and plant a bomb in Mace Windu's chambers. This would exact his revenge for the Jedi killing his father. The plan failed, but he did succeed in bringing the cruiser down. Just before that, he boarded an escape pod with some of the clone cadets. This is one of the signs that he still followed his father's teachings of the Canons of Honor and the Rezul Nari. When Boba was being retrieved by Aura Singh from the escape pod, he showed a compassion for the innocent cadets left behind. He wanted to save them, but Singh gave him no choice. The plan ultimately failed with another attempt on Mace Windu's life on the surface below. When he was being arrested, he told Mace Windu, I know I've done wrong, but I will never forgive you for killing my father. This is another sign of remorse for innocent lives lost from his actions. Another sign that he followed the teachings of Jango Fett and the true Mandalorian ways. Boba would eventually escape prison with the help of Cad Bane and others, then go on to continue learning the bounty hunting trade. During the Clone Wars, he would become skilled at it and even lead his own group of bounty hunters with Bosk and Dengar and eventually retrieve his father's armor that had been left to him along with the Slave One. During an altercation with Cad Bane, Boba attempted to save innocent villagers from the mature Bane. It ended in a duel where both shot each other in the head and Boba got his iconic dent. After this incident, Boba Fett would go off on his own, just as his father had done before him. He would also become the most successful and feared bounty hunter in the galaxy, just as his father before him. During the imperial reign of the galaxy, Boba would take on high paid jobs, including a retainer to Darth Vader himself. He was nothing but successful for the Sith Lord. Boba was the one to find Luke Skywalker after the destruction of the first Death Star and report his name to Darth Vader, in turn inadvertently telling Darth Vader that his son did not die in childbirth. The last mission Boba Fett performed for Darth Vader was the beginning of his own disappearance. He successfully tracked down Han Solo and the Millennium Falcon to Cloud City. Boba eventually gained control of the frozen smuggler and transported him to Tatooine for a price that Jabba the Hutt had on Solo's head. Later, Solo's friends arrive and begin rescuing Han. In the battle over the Sarlacc pit, clumsy Han Solo bumped into Boba, sending him falling out of control into the mouth of the Sarlacc. Believed to be dead, Boba reemerges five years later to retrieve his armor and helps Din Djarin rescue Grogu or Baby Yoda if you prefer. When that mission is complete, Boba Fett and his accomplice, Fennec Shand, kill the remaining thugs in Jabba's palace and take control of the former gangster's fortress. Okay, that brings us up to the current timeline. In December, the next chapter of Boba Fett's life will unfold in the Disney Plus series, The Book of Boba Fett. For a character that began as a throwaway, with no intentions of a backstory, he has become complex and even more intriguing than he was. There isn't just canon material about him, but there's a whole list of legend stories wrote about him as well. Even though he seems changed now, I'm sure this isn't the end of his story as a Mandalorian and a scoundrel. So, stay tuned to this channel as I update with new Boba Fett adventures as they come available. But what is your favorite Boba Fett moment? Is he even one of your favorite characters? If not, let me know in the comments below who your favorite character is. I'd love to talk about the most famous bounty hunter in the galaxy and my favorite Star Wars character, but I will talk about other characters as well. You could also leave a comment as to a video you'd like to see me make. But that's all I have for this Boba Fett Friday. I'll see you Saturday at 10 a.m. Eastern United States time for a live stream and Q&A. Thank you for watching, and remember, this is the way the only way.